Another grim milestone for the U.S. The country's COVID death toll passes the one million mark. Did anyone think the pandemic would hit this hard? And how much of a threat does the virus still pose? I'm Jafar Hasdan and today's newsmaker is COVID-19. When COVID-19 first emerged in China, few would have predicted the level of devastation it would cause. In just over two years, at least six million people have lost their lives to the virus, and more than a million of them hail from the U.S. It is the highest official global death toll, and U.S. President Joe Biden marked the tragic milestone by warning Americans and the world that the virus is still not behind us. There's still so much left to do. This pandemic isn't over. Today, we mark a tragic milestone here in the United States. One million COVID deaths, one million empty chairs around the family dinner table. Each irreplaceable, irreplaceable losses. Six million is already a staggering number, but in reality, the true death toll is likely much higher. According to the World Health Organization, almost 15 million people have probably lost their lives because of the pandemic. Many nations are thought to have underreported and in some cases by a lot. Here are just some of the numbers. India's official death toll is close to 490,000, but the WHO believes it's actually closer to 4.7 million. Egypt says about 21,000 people have died. But the UN body says the number of excess deaths is almost 12 times higher. It's a similar story in Pakistan, where the mortality rate is eight times higher than the government's official numbers. In Indonesia, the WHO estimates there have been one million deaths as a result of the virus, compared to the officially reported 144,000. And in Bangladesh, it's believed to be five times higher than the government's official death toll. We have been repeatedly told that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Well, the nations have vaccinated the vast majority of its populations, but the world's poorest are lagging behind. Especially in Africa, in Nigeria, Sudan and Somalia, only about 8% are fully vaccinated. It is even lower in Mali, where just over 5% have received two doses. And in Madagascar, it is just over 4%. But in the UK, almost three quarters of the population have received both jabs. And in the US, it is two thirds. President Joe Biden said it was crucial that more people worldwide should receive their vaccinations. We have to double down on our efforts to get, to get shots in people's arms country by country, community by community. Ensure we have reliable and predictable supplies of vaccines and boosters for everyone, everywhere. Expand access globally to tests and treatments. And we have it to prevent complacency. Despite the vaccination, new variants have still caused chaos. When Omicron hit, infection rates skyrocketed. And there are some scientists who fear another mutation could do something similar and the world needs to remain vigilant. As we all know, the virus is uh, evolving, changing its behaviors, becoming more transmissible. And um, with that changing behavior, uh, changing your, uh, uh, you know, uh, measures will be, will be very important. Let's get it straight to our panel now. Joining me from Pittsburgh is Dr. Amish Adalja. He's a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. From London is Global Health Advisor Oksana Pizik. She's also a senior teaching fellow at the University College London's School of Pharmacy. And in Geneva is Edward Kelly. He was the director for the World Health Organization's Integrated Health Services and is now the global health lead for Apiject, a company working on vaccine deployment. Thank you very much all for being with us today here on The Newsmakers. When the pandemic began, I remember 
uh, speaking to this friend of mine who happens to be a data scientist in the US. At the time, he told me that based on his analysis, up to 2 million people could die from COVID. And I have to say, I was shocked when I heard that figure because 2 million is a big number, isn't it? But he was wrong, and uh, just like him, the predictions of many others have been wrong too. Here we are today, more than 6 million people have died across the world, more than 1 million in the US alone. Dr. Kelly, did you, at the start of the pandemic, think coronavirus would be this devastating for the US? Certainly not. Uh, when the outbreak started, I was with WHO. I just finished an analysis of the Chinese healthcare system. They had a 10-year health reform, and we were looking at what would be the impact in China and how could it be contained. But it was very clear that it was going to have a widespread early, early on. But uh, it was also clear that we know how to prevent respiratory uh, illnesses and respiratory illness spread. So we already had some tools, even though vaccines didn't exist. But predicting the numbers that we have seen now uh, in the US, particularly 1 million dead, and many, many more times that from the ancillary effects of not getting the care that you might have needed for your cancer, for your diabetes, and, and others, uh, was not predictable at the time. And I think even the worst predictions from experts would not have uh, seen that coming. Indeed. Uh, now, 1 million deaths in the US, that's uh, a big number. Dr. Adalja, help us understand what could possibly explain the staggering mortality rate in the US. It's multiple factors that basically coalesce to give us this horrendous death toll. I would say the first 100,000 deaths or so were probably not preventable. I think those would have occurred no matter what we did, even if everything was perfect. But what we've seen since that time has been really poor public health messaging, poor public health actions, uh, an inability to use targeted interventions that are known to decrease uh, transmission, as well as distrust of public health authorities, which cause people to be less compliant with recommendations. Then on top of that, we have a virulent anti-vaccine movement. And if you look and see that there's been more deaths since the vaccine has been available than before the vaccine was available, and many of those deaths are vaccine preventable. So some estimates show that maybe 50% of the deaths that occurred in 2021 were vaccine preventable deaths. So a lot of what happened here is not so much because of the virus, but because of human factors that accelerated the ability of this virus to cause so much damage. I just want to pick up on uh, what you just said, Dr. Adalja, about the vaccine. Oksana, let me come to you here. Now, certainly since the beginning of this pandemic, officials in the United States have struggled to convince people to take the jab. Why was that? Do you think there was a problem with how the message was being communicated to the masses in the U.S.? I think it's uh, not just limited to the U.S. There has been um, some pretty prevalent anti-vaccine stances all around the world, and, and this even predates COVID-19. I think certainly the health uh, messaging could have been improved, but that's not uh, the only uh, problem. And we also see the, the huge polarization that occurs uh, within the United States and, and, and using healthcare as a weapon. Uh, means that uh, it, it got dragged into um, identity politics as well. So it becomes very challenging then to build that bridge of which health should be uh, in that kind of context. But in Russia and other countries, in the Baltic states, uh, also low vaccine uptake, um, and in other countries um, that desperately wanted them, didn't have access to them. So, so a real tragedy in that sense that um, some of the most uh, wealthy countries in the world, um, were people were refusing them and others around the world were dying because they did not have access to them. Oksana, let me add one more question here. It's clear that anti-vax movements have played a pivotal role in exacerbating the pandemic, not just in the US, but across the world. Tell me uh, from your experience, what is the best way to address anti-vaxxers? <laughs> well, I think that that's a very challenging question. Um, and, and many of uh, our viewers will have probably had, um, you know, quite, quite uh, difficult conversations with family and, and loved ones uh, trying to, to persuade them. Now, certainly from a, a like healthcare professional view and, and what we teach our um, uh, 
students who are who are pharmacists, vaccinators, doctors, etc., um, is is of course to listen to the, to the concerns that people have. Right, this is on a spectrum. Not everyone is going to take a very hard line um, anti-vaccine view just because they don't trust the government. Certainly there is a, a sector of the population that is that way. Uh, but making sure that uh, questions and concerns about um, how vaccines are made, how medicines are made, how we can, how they can know that they are safe and to also understand uh, those benefits is vital. I think if we don't listen to um, the very valid questions people have about how these work and, and how we can we know that we can trust them um, and, and just take a very uh, dictatorial type of view, then we're, we're going to continue to lose a lot of uh, people. And, and I, I do think in, in the height of the urgency of, of the pandemic, it, it was a lot of top-down messaging um, in some instances via press conference, et cetera. Uh, but at a community level, making sure that we're also reaching out towards um, other authorities, whether that be uh, religious leaders, et cetera, to, to also uh, lead by example within their own communities, that has really shown to be effective, particularly amongst ethnic and minority groups. Okay, uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, how much responsibility in your view do politicians uh uh, have to take when it comes to the worsening of the pandemic, especially in the U.S. Uh, I clearly remember uh, back when uh, numbers were on the rise in the U.S., President Donald Trump, who was the president back then, came on television and said, this is not uh, uh, something dangerous, this is just like a flu. And when there were clear guidelines issued by the World Health Organization not to shake hands with people, he said, no, I'm going to do that anyway. So uh, tell me, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you've hit the nail on the head and, and our other guests have talked about the importance of correct messaging early on. Clearly, uh, the previous administration in the US didn't get it right. Um, the current administration isn't always getting it right. But actually, if you look across all the countries that Debbie Joe, for instance, works with, almost no country got it 100% right. Many of them made messaging mistakes. Even the WHO made some early mistakes around issues around messages on airborne, uh, et cetera. But I think the other message, two other messages to say that should have been emphasized more is one, we have a whole bunch of gaps that we're dealing with in peacetime. That is people who don't have access to care, who are in rural areas, uh, ethnic minorities, et cetera. All of those fared much worse with COVID, but they fare much worse during normal times as well. So these were gaps in our health systems in the US, but in many other countries' health systems that existed before and we need to address, COVID's just shown a light on them. Uh, the second uh, issue is really trying to uh, talk about not just vaccine doses. We were very early on talking about access to vaccine doses and vaccines don't actually protect people. Vaccinations protect people. We didn't spend enough time and enough resources funding the health workforce, uh, funding syringes, funding other supplies that we might need to make sure vaccination programs in the US, but around the world could function uh, efficiently. Okay, now let's uh, broaden the discussion. Uh, certainly uh, when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic across the world, there have been a decrease in the total number of uh, cases that are being reported on a daily basis, uh, but still the pandemic is far from over. Dr. Adalja, when the pandemic began, Doctors uh, said, we don't know much about uh, COVID-19 and how it progresses in uh, the body. It's been about uh, two and a half years now. Are there still any dark corners when it comes to COVID-19 coronavirus, or do we know everything about this virus? There are still many unanswered questions, questions that would impact the clinical care of COVID-19 patients. We still don't have good markers for who's going to have a severe case, who's going to have a mild case. We don't know who is going to develop <clears throat> long COVID symptoms or symptoms after they've recovered. Uh, understanding that is one of probably the biggest unanswered questions. We still need to get more clinical questions answered on the best treatment protocols, who should be getting combination therapy, who should be getting monoclonal antibodies, who should be getting antivirals. Trying to really delineate among them is going to be important. And then we still don't quite understand the evolution of variants. We know how certain variants have arisen, but 
the Omicron variant, the dominant version, we still don't understand its origin. Did this evolve in, in an immunocompromised person where it had time to mutate? Did this come from an animal in a reverse? zoonosis, that humans infected the animal and the animals infected the human. So there's going to be a lot of scientific questions that are going to be needed to be answered, inc including about vaccine strategies. How do we develop better vaccines? Uh, and should we be targeting more than just the spike protein? Lots of lots of questions that need to be answered. Indeed, uh, Dr. Dalda, if I may, how much uh, more time would it take for doctors to address these unanswered questions? Because this is certainly a question which is on people's mind right now. It's likely going to be years before we get definitive answers. We're still learning things about viruses that we have discovered from the very beginning of the, the era of virology. We're still learning things about influenza and HIV. So there'll never be sort of an end to knowing everything we need to know. But these most pressing questions, I think, could probably be answered within the next year or so. Okay. Uh, Oksana, given the fact there are still many unanswered questions when it comes to COVID-19, what kind of threat does it pose to humanity, to people, right now? Well, I think one of the largest threats is that um, we un uh, underplay the severity of the damage caused. Um, WHO recently reported that um, deaths related uh, to COVID-19 reached over 15 million uh, globally. Um, some of the, the countries hit the hardest by that uh, included Egypt, India, Pakistan. Um, and so I think that other threats, of course, include that if we don't continue to monitor, and uh, a lot of countries are now dropping those testing regimes, we're not tracking the variants as much. Um, we aren't necessarily learning from the, the past mistakes. Uh, of course, we are in a much better position now thanks to those vaccines. But um, as was just mentioned, there are a lot of other therapeutics that also need to be um, deployed and used across the world. And we're still trying to solve the problem of vaccine equity. So if we continue to uh, go forward blind without actively tracking those variants, lots of the data that we're getting now here in the UK is just based on hospitalizations uh, of older people. Uh, so we are we, we risk playing in the dark, and, and I think that's a big threat. So if we are still playing in the dark, uh, Oksana, tell me, is it a good idea for countries across the world to relax COVID-19 restrictions? Because that is what's happening right now. More and more countries uh, every other day are lifting COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, yeah, and as we as we have uh, just seen in the United States, uh, hospitalizations have gone up by 20%. So we see that um, there is still that fluctuation. Uh, you can, uh, depending on the local situation, you know, it's going to be different in different regions of the world, um, relax uh, restrictions. But uh, that doesn't mean that you should um, drop vigilance. And that means that you are still understanding what is happening with the virus and the variants. Uh, so I think that while perhaps, you know, you, you can uh, have more of the uh, aspect of, uh, let's say, pre-COVID life, alongside of that, we should also ensure that we're investing in proper uh, surveillance systems and just um, air filtration systems. That has completely dropped off the policy agenda here in the UK. The US has done a little bit better than that in certain regions, uh, but that's something that we should be looking at, not just for COVID, but for all respiratory uh, illnesses and viruses. We could be really reducing the burden on the NHS Long COVID is going to continue to put a lot of pressure on the healthcare workforce and healthcare system. Uh, here in the UK, that's already uh, cracking, and we're seeing a lot of um, build up uh, as a result of that, and that's going to impact uh, health outcomes. And absolutely, we will see that the the in the following years, people are going to have uh, worse health outcomes as a result of everything that has happened. To okay, this point. Uh, uh, Dr. Kelly, I will come to you, Oksana. Let me add one more question here very quickly, a yes or no. Are we relaxing too soon? Uh, with the testing, certainly too soon. Okay. Dr. Kelly, now let's talk about uh, vaccinations. Uh, vaccines have played a key role in, uh, uh, you know, helping humanity uh, go back to pre-pandemic levels in, uh, in some sense, but still there is a long way ahead. Now, wealthy nations uh, have vaccinated a vast majority of uh, its populations. Uh, but when you look at the developing world, especially poor countries, uh, they have not uh, received enough doses. So how important is it uh, for authorities, uh, world leaders, to ensure that 
no one is safe until everyone is safe. Well, you said it perfectly. Uh, the definition of a pandemic is that it is global. So you can't end a pandemic in one country or two countries. It has to be ended on a, at a global level. Now, regarding vaccines, there was early investment in them. They've uh, been rolled out now, um, billions of doses rolled out around the world, but very uh, unequally. You only have about 16, 18% of low-income countries vaccinated even with one dose, and we know what that, where that got us uh, in developed countries. So the it's quite clear with Omicron, we had a big wave of uh, sickness and death that was not recorded in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia, and the impact has already been felt. The goal that WHO had originally set out there with the other partners in what's known as the ACT Accelerator, the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, was 70% of the world uh, being vaccinated. Uh, it's clearly not now seen as a realistic goal. We haven't been good enough at vaccinations, which is what I was saying earlier. Uh, but making sure that we vaccinate the elderly and healthcare workers, 100% of them in countries around the world is really going to be uh, crucial if we're going to be able to manage this. Dr. Kelly, if uh, I may interject, uh, now, if that was not a realistic goal, is it safe to say that this pandemic is here to stay? I think the pandemic is not here to stay. COVID-19 certainly is here to stay. We'll see uh, predictions um, even on uh, this show uh, have not been accurate even a few months out, but certainly people are worried about uh, rise next winter and um, uh, moving on from that. But the real game changer will be whether we see a new variant that breaks through some of the immunity that we've already had from vaccines or, or previous infection. Okay, Dr. Adalja, so there are concerns uh, now whether or not uh, we will see a new variant in the foreseeable future, only time will tell. But given the fact there is a still a large chunk of the population, especially in uh, poor countries who are not vaccinated, just help us understand how much, uh, how much of a risk does that pose to, towards the discovery of a possible new variant? We are always going to see new variants of SARS-CoV-2. You have to remember that this virus comes from a family of viruses that causes about 30% of our common colds. So the virus will always evolve to get around some of the immunity that vaccines and prior infections provide us. So when you have places where there is low vaccination coverage and low immunity, the virus can spread unchecked. So it may have the opportunity to mutate more and more in those situations. And you could see new variants come from places where the virus is less controlled. So, and the other point is, is that if you have health systems overwhelmed, if you have econo economies completely disrupted because the, the virus is out of control, like we're seeing right now in Shanghai, we, it's out of control there. They have lockdowns. We don't have IV contrast material to do CAT scans in the United States. That's going to be something that keeps the, whole, the world held back. So it is important to defeat this pandemic in every corner of the globe if we are truly to move on. Okay. Now we are in uh, the dying minutes uh, of uh, the program. Oksana, let me come to you. This is uh, something I believe uh, is on everyone's mind. Uh, right now, I have spoken to my friends, my family, and even my colleagues uh, here at work, and we all wonder what would it take for this pandemic to end? Uh, well, I think we just heard about areas where those um, where the virus is uh, transmitting in much uh, higher uh, amounts because they have uh, lower vaccine coverage. So I think plugging those gaps in vaccine coverage as much as possible um, and also looking at potentially uh, pan-coronavirus type vaccines that are effective against um, uh, other types of variants so that we have uh, that type of tool in our disposal as well. Um, in, and, and then making sure that these antivirals that um, are, are effective are getting to different countries. Um, they're not widely used everywhere yet. Uh, so I think it's also looking at the tools we do have now, making sure we're employing them, um, supporting the logistics on the ground where they're needed most. Um, it's, uh, as we heard from Dr. Kelly, it's not just about the, the technology itself, it's also about getting that um, jab in arms. So uh, getting that widespread and then also ensuring that we have uh, the, the uh, forward-looking uh, solutions uh, in our pocket as well. So I think 
there are uh, who, there are lots of wins that we can celebrate um, uh, alongside some of the, the fastest uh, development of medicines that we have seen that have been very effective because of the financial investment and the other incentives around it. So from that perspective, I think from a scientific perspective, the drug development has been um, a large success. I think the political challenges, the public acceptability have been the greatest barriers. We need to push through those finally, and we can get a better control on, on the problem areas. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for joining us today here on The Newsmakers. And thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Jafar Hasnan. See you next time.